There's, there's more in the back. There's a couple spots here. If you're coming in from outside, you're welcome to do that. Um, okay, we are going to read our passage first here, um, and then we'll kind of go into this. I want to warn you, though, um, today is a little bit like drinking from a fire hose. If you're not sure what that means, imagine the movies with the firemen, and they have the hose, and the water comes gushing out, and just trying to take a little sip of that. And so there's going to be a lot, but a lot of it is still introductory, and I really do, in these two months of us going through the book of Galatians, I want to encourage you, go home and study it and read it again and, and double-check it and learn something new and go down a different, so to say, rabbit trail because you found a verse or a word that interests you. Those are all great ways for us to grow personally in our spiritual walk um, and in our spiritual lives. So here's what this says. From Galatians 2, I'll read from 11 to 21. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to, this is Paul speaking, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, so that by their hypocrisy even Barnabas was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. If while we seek to be justified in Christ, it becomes evident that we ourselves are sinners, does that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, I prove that I am a lawbreaker. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ and no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I live by faith in the, the life I live in this body. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Father, thank you for our time together, that we can look at your word. Thank you that you can show us and help us to understand what you're saying through your Holy Spirit. And so I pray, I pray for myself, Lord, that what you have, what I have read and what you have taught me, that I would be able to share that with, with um, our family, our church here. Lord, I pray you'd help me to speak clearly, help, help me to, to say things in an understandable manner. But Lord, I acknowledge again, only you can change us. Only your Holy Spirit can change our hearts. So as we look at this, we pray that you would be our teacher, that you would be our guide, and that you would show us who you are and what your way and what your will is. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, go ahead. I have found in my life that I have lots of problems. And, uh, especially my kids are like, Dad, what's your problem? Come on, Dad. But, and, and so, but, but I want to kind of not be at this, oh, what's your problem level? I want to go a little bit deeper. Some of you guys look at me like your kids never say that to you. Is that true? Is it only me? <laughs> but I want to go a little bit deeper. And I want to talk about two dilemmas. There are many dilemmas that we have as human beings. But I want to talk specifically about two dilemmas. So two problems that we need to figure out and we try to figure out. And sometimes we do that consciously and sometimes we even do that unconsciously. Now, of course, you figured out by now that I'm a Christian, I believe what the Bible teaches, and we're in church. And so, of course, this is geared towards what, does, what is God's role in these questions as well. But I understand that not everybody here may be a Christian. In fact, some of you may be atheists. But I think the question, the problem, is the same. And the first dilemma that we have as humans is that we can't live at peace with God, with ourselves, with others, and with creation. Everywhere you look, there is conflict. And all the time, people say, oh, you know, right? Like, in my heart, I'm not comfortable, right? 
And so this idea of like we're, we're always looking to, to like fix, like, ah, like the guanxi, the relationship is broken, and that relationship isn't right, okay? Now, we're actually going to tackle this in October, November, um, looking at our relationships, kind of ma- these four major relationships we have, and break that down a little bit more. Second dilemma, which we're going to look at today, is this dilemma that we have, this, this, this sense, this urge that we have that we want to be fulfilled maybe if you're an atheist or if you're not a Christian, or I think it's a good way to describe it even for Christians. We want this idea that we feel justified, we feel righteous, we feel restored, and, and our dilemma is that to get to that point in our lives, you know that xin li hen sufu, right? Like in my heart I have that peace. Really it's the same conclusion, like I just can't get there. I just can't get there. And so it's so easy. And when you get a little bit older, you get frustrated by 22-year-old consultants, right? Sorry, those of you who are going to be 22-year-old consultants. It's like, you don't know anything yet. I've tried to find the answers for so long. But, but the sense of searching, the sense of longing, the sense of feeling like something just isn't right, isn't there more? Shouldn't I be doing more? Even as a Christian, ah. Shouldn't I be just doing a bit more? And it can, for us, either be paralyzing, and we're like, well, you know, the grace of God will cover it all, so hallelujah, and uh, I'll do whatever I want. It can cause us to go into a sense of depression and guilt, because some of you may have grown up, those of you who grew up in a more Taiwanese or German culture, you know, the sense of performing and not good enough and and a little bit more and you got to do a little bit more, you know, and it's just never enough. It can lead us to just a complete sense of guilt that if you were just a better Christian, if you were just a better person, then you wouldn't feel this way. You'd have that total peace from God in your heart if you just do a little bit more, if you can just do a little bit, work a little bit harder, pray a little bit harder. Or... It can cause us to actually say, well, forget that. If this is what God demands of me, then I don't want anything to do with it. But that longing, that longing stays. Now, I want to suggest one thing to you. Even if we get this right, and I think Paul tells us how to get it right, because we are eagerly waiting for Jesus to return when all things will be restored, we will always have a sense of longing in our hearts. Okay, so we're not trying to get rid of the sense of longing because we can't, because we wait for Christ to return. And until he returns, we'll have that desire like, there's got to be something more because the answer is yes, there is something more. But for here and now, how can we deal with some of this? And I think Paul actually helps us with this and looking at this. And we're going to do a quick review here. I know, I know I review forever. I think two Sundays ago, the whole thing was a review. Um, but here we go. <clears throat> so in Galatians 1, 1 to 10, Paul is shocked. He's writing to the church in Galatia, and um, you have, he, he, he's shocked, he's disturbed, he's upset. He says, I am shocked that you so quickly deserted the gospel, you abandoned the gospel, you turned away from the gospel. The good news, or the Greek word there is the evangelion, okay? This idea of the good news. You had the good news, you embraced it, and then you turned away from it, and you pursued something that wasn't a gospel after all. And so then we looked at how Paul actually very clearly and very succinctly explains to us the key points of what the gospel is. What is the good news? And it's these four things. Christ died. We're sinful. He was buried. He was, oh, sorry, there's five. He was buried, he was raised, and he appeared again. So the gospel in its core, when Paul says, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, in which you received and in which you have taken your stand. This gospel, these five statements are strong enough to be a solid foundation for you for the rest of your life. If by this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preach to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. Christ died for our sins. We have to understand, Jesus didn't die just to die. He died to pay for our sins. Okay, That sin part is part of the gospel. But the sin part being taken care of by Jesus' death, that's what the good news is. 
And we'll explain that a bit more, that he was buried, that he was raised, and that he appeared. And so in a nutshell, Galatians 1, 1 to 10, the Galatians said, yes, Jesus, yes, believing in Jesus, plus I've got to go back to the old way and obey the laws. So it's a Jesus plus gospel. And I put gospel in. If you're an English teacher, you're not supposed to put quotation marks around two words in a row. I know that. But just hang with me. It's Jesus plus and then an untrue gospel, a gospel that isn't a gospel at all. Galatians 2, really quickly, and Joey shared on this, gave us 10 very, very good points on how we can actually evaluate if something is biblical or not. And so I just want to pull two things out here really quickly. The first is that we have to understand that Paul is called directly by God, his message is directly from God. It see, see, it says there in verse 11, I received this by revelation from Jesus Christ. Okay? And then after four, so this is, and this is something, I've got to be very careful how I say this here. My Bible is the red letter edition. It really bothers me. Some of you are like, who cares? No, I'm German. It bothers me. Things will all, a German will always be bothered by something. Because it almost means that, well, those red letter words are more important than everything else in the Bible. Because they're red letter and it's what Jesus said. And we have to be really, really careful. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that all Scripture is God-breathed. Not just the red letters is God-breathed, but all Scripture is God-breathed, useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Okay? And Paul says here, this letter that he wrote, this gospel that he shares and the letters that he writes is a direct revelation from Jesus Christ. So don't throw everything out and say, well, it's so confusing. I'm just going to read the red letter stuff and then I'm going to do what you know, I'm supposed to do off the... Yes, do that. Do the red letter stuff. But do all the black letter stuff too. Know all the black letter stuff too. And so then Paul in Galatians 2, he says after 14 years, he goes to Jerusalem and he wants to confirm that his message is correct. I went in response to a revelation and meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, so the church leaders in Jerusalem, I presented to them the gospel that I preach among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure... That's a lot of humility there, right? Paul, trained better than anybody, a brilliant man. I wanted to be sure. I wanted to be sure that I was not running and it had not been, that I was not running and had not been, (coughs) excuse me, running my race in vain. And so this is where we're going to build on now. Go ahead, let's go to Galatians. Oh, no, 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 of course not. One more review. And we're going to deal with the covenants a bit more in next Sunday and the following Sunday. But um, I just, I point this out here because at the foundation of what Paul is saying lies, like we have to understand what covenants are, okay? And a covenant, a covenant is a contract, all right? A covenant is a contract that is made between two people or groups of people. I have a covenant contract with my landlord. He will let me live there. I will pay the rent. It's his house, so he's got to fix stuff, but I'll pay the rent on time. Okay? And so what we need to understand here, I just have this up really, really quickly here. In the Old Testament, there is more than one covenant. Okay? There's more than one. And some people will argue, some theologians will say, well, a covenant requires a sacrifice, so they'll pull some of these out. But these are the big promises, the overarching promises that God has in the Bible. We have below the covenant with Adam, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with Abraham, the covenant with David. And then you'll see that kind of that fat, chunky arrow in the middle that says, I know it's small, sorry about that, covenant on Mount Sinai, the Mosaic Law, which came 430 years after Abraham, Okay. And this is what we usually refer to as the law, okay? You must obey the law. Well, there's a law that God gave to Adam. Be fruitful and multiply. It's part of the Adamic covenant, okay? But that's not what we say. We say, oh, you have to obey the law. No one's talking about Adam. No one's talking about Noah. No one's talking about them. We're always referring to the law that God gave to Moses and the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. A few months ago, oh, of course you're not going to remember this, why do I? Anyway, let's, I'll humor myself. A few months ago, remember, I said that the law defines the relationship, right? And this is a quote by Tim Keller. The law defines the relationship. So this law, this law that God gave to the people of Israel through Moses on Mount Sinai, this law was to determine what our relationship will be like. I'm going to say this very carefully, and I want to make sure you listen to the very end. 
God did not make this relationship arrangement with me because I did not live at that time. I was not, I'm not a Jew. I did not live at that time, okay? So this is a contract relationship with the people of Israel at that time. It was bilateral where God says, I will and you must do this, and if you don't do this, then I will punish you. It's a two-way, bilateral, two-sided covenant, okay? And so this is that one when we always talk about the law. And this is what Paul refers to when he talks about the Judaizers. Okay, that's just those who go back to the old Jewish Judaic traditions. Those are the Judaizers. Okay? And he's referring to these laws, this contract, this relationship, <laughs> define the DTR, define the relationship between God and his people. All right? And then we come into a different covenant. And this is the covenant of grace. And this is a new covenant. When the Bible talks about the new covenant, and again, we'll go into this much um, too deep already. We'll go into this even deeper in two Sundays. When Jesus says that the old covenant is fulfilled, and this is a new covenant, the communion we just celebrated, it's a symbol of the new covenant. It is not the old covenant. But this is the tension that the church in Galatia had. What do we do about all these old laws and these old traditions? I mean, they're from God after all, right? I mean, that tattoo law is from God after all. So what do we do about them? And now Jesus says, well, that law is fulfilled. It's obsolete. But then he says, but not one iota, not one dot of it is going to be, it's going to be forever. But you got a new covenant. And so this is the tension, this is the confusion that the people in Galatia had, and it was easier to go back to this old covenant because it makes sense. Teachers, how do you grade, do you still grade papers? I think you still do, right? Not just like rubrics. But how do you, if you do rubrics, how do you grade it? How do you know if they're a good student or if they passed or not? Well, you have a standard and you measure against the standard. And if you hit all the standards, you're a good student. Well, it's like that with our behavior. I can give you 100 different behavior commands, and if you can meet 99 of them, then, hey, you're doing a pretty good job as a Christian. It's our natural tendency to go back to that. So I want to suggest to you, this is not a problem the Galatians have, or had, because they're all dead. This is a problem that we also have. Let's go to the next one. Ah, my introductions. Ah, there we go. That's a Galatian problem. Oh, two words here that are really important, and I've made them super big, so no, I can barely see them myself. In the Old Covenant, the covenant on Sinai, the Mosaic Law, the Mosaic Covenant, or the law, the key phrase is, I must. In order for me to be blessed, I must do what? Ah, oh, we like that too today, don't we? God, what do, I, what do you need me to do to get more blessing, right? You know, like, how do I get even more blessings from God, right? I must. And if you don't, I will punish you, God says. All the punishment of the people of Israel was contractual. God said he'd do it. They didn't obey, so he did it. No surprises, okay? Most of the prophecies by the Old Testament prophets were just saying, hey, God's going to keep his word. You better look out. God's going to keep his word. You better look out. The key word here in the covenant of grace, the new covenant, which, by the way, is a one-sided covenant, it's unilateral, it only goes one way, is the word I can. Not I must, but I can. And I'll take it one step further. I want to. <laughs> Sometimes I don't want to, I know. That's why I reluctantly take it that one step further. But it's this idea that I, I can. I can do this. I can lead this life. Go ahead. Oh, dear. There's 20 minutes of... All right. So, we're now in our passage. <clears throat> and we had a conflict in the church. And this conflict is the spark that brings up this theological, philosophical discussion. Because people in Jerusalem said that all Gentiles... Gentiles only means non-Jewish people. Those outside the old Mosaic Covenant. Okay. We don't use that word so much anymore. Actually, I don't think we use it hardly at all anymore. But this idea that they had to go back and follow some of the Old Testament laws. And then it was settled in Jerusalem. But Paul says, but then Peter went north to Antioch. 
So when Peter, Cephas is Peter, when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face. (laughs) Haha, I would like to have been there. Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself, separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. Barnabas, you'll remember, is the encourager. He's the nice guy who goes along and makes sure everybody is doing okay. And so even he was pulled into this group of, man, we used to hang out with these people who are not part of the covenant. And then people came and they like, like, you really should do that? Look at what the Old Testament says. And they withdrew themselves because they were afraid. And Paul calls this out. He calls him out in public in front of everybody. And he says, that's hypocrisy. That's not right. You used to, he says right there, you're a Jew, yet you live like a, uh, you used to go eat with them, but now you don't anymore. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel. That's the standard. Not not acting in line with what the old Mosaic law said. See, that's not the standard Paul is comparing it to here. Paul is saying they did not live in line, act in line with the truth of the gospel. I said to Cephas in front of all of them, you're a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? So he called them out. So this is the problem. Going back to the old way. The old way is something we're comfortable with. The old way is something that we can measure. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The old way is just, I can see if I'm doing a good job or not. And so now this is where Paul goes really deep, really quickly. And he says this, and we read over this so quickly, but I hope that today, through the Holy Spirit, teaching you in your heart, like, you can go a little bit deeper on this. I know I'm just scratching the surface trying to learn more and more about this. But Paul says this, we who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles, we know this. And what do you know? We know that a person is not justified, he's not made right, he's not made whole, he doesn't get a sense of fulfillment by the works of the law. See, we already know this. Well, how do they know this? Well, the Old Testament is actually full of it. All along, salvation, justification has always been by faith. It's never been by works. It's never been by obeying the law. So he says, we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And so, (coughs) excuse me, if this is how we are justified, if this is how we are made right, if this is how we get that shalom, peace in our hearts, that right? in our hearts, like total peace in our hearts, so then we have put our faith in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, so we may be justified by faith in Christ. And not by the works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. If you obey the Ten Commandments, you will not be justified. Those of you who are... No, I won't say that. Yes, I will. Okay. Those of you who are from the United States, putting up the Ten Commandments will not change your country. You have to understand that because following the law does not justify you. Now, it's not bad to put up the Ten Commandments. Just don't think your country will change if you put up the Ten Commandments. I talked to my dad about this, and of course, you know, I told you last time, I I don't tell him too much about what I'm talking about because then he like, you think I take a long time explaining things. I'm on the phone for three hours with him. But he told me, those of you from a Taiwanese background, he said, when he, my dad, if, if, if you don't know my family background, my, my parents were missionaries from Germany to Taiwan in the uh, 1960s, 70s, 80s, early 90s, and were here for a while, and uh, you know, worked with the Taiwanese Presbyterian Church, so very, very local. Um, that's why, no, don't worry, why? Well, that's not why I'm the way, that's why I am the way I am, sorry. Um, but, but he would say that when a Taiwanese family became Christians, There was a big ceremony, and they would take the altar off the altar shelf, and they would take it out in the street, 
And sometimes this would happen publicly, and they would burn it. And everybody would watch. And the whole community would say, these people are breaking with the tradition. They're destroying the idol. It's a tremendous testimony, right? And then he said, after a few months, they realized the wall is empty. Because if you're Taiwanese, you know every house must have a wall that's for the idols. It always has to be in the right position, right? You gotta, it's got to like face the door. You can't just like put it in a corner. No, every wall, there is a specific place in a traditional Taiwanese home where the idol goes. And my dad said the Taiwanese Christians would realize the space is empty. The space is empty. What do we do? What do we do? The space is empty. So they put up either a picture of Jesus or a picture of the Ten Commandments. Just because, again, those are not bad things. Don't misunderstand me. But this idea of like, that can't be it. That can't be it. There's got to be more. Which is the Galatian problem? Jesus plus something. And then I'm saved and then I'm set. Let's go on. I'm going way too long here. <laughs> All right, this is small. But uh, you can read Romans 3, 20 and verse 20 to 28 on here. Okay, this is the key thing. Because I want to build on this when Paul says no one is justified by obeying the law. No one is justified by obeying the law. This is from Romans, and we really need to read Romans and Galatians hand in hand. That's why for your homework, I had you read um, Romans 6, 7, 8. And uh, it's again, I know all of you did it, but you can read it again for next Sunday, because I know you all did. It says this. I may have to get closer too. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Next week or the following week, I forgot which one, we'll actually look more detail what's the purpose of the law. Because there's got to be a purpose for the law. Well, one of them here is become more conscious of our sin. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known. And so the goal here is to have the righteousness of God, to be made right before God. And so apart from the law which we knew never made you righteous, there's a different way how the righteousness of God can be made known. And this is to what the laws and the prophets testify. I'm sorry, that's in green. I can barely see that myself. It says, This righteousness from God is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. You see, the righteousness is given to you not because you follow the law, but the righteousness to be made right in your heart is given to you because you believe in Jesus Christ. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Stop making these divisions because all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came from Christ Jesus Quit saying, well, for us Jews, it's like this. For you Gentiles, well, us Taiwanese, you don't understand the whole history with the idols and all that. Oh, you Germans, you got real problems, right? No, that's gone. We're all sinners, and we're all justified through faith in Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. There it is again. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. You see, God is the one who justifies. Your good behavior doesn't justify because you don't have the power to justify. Only God can justify you. And the way he does it is if you believe in Jesus, he takes his righteousness, Jesus' righteousness, and he gives it to you. So where is your boasting then? It's excluded because of the law, the law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of law. Go ahead. I'll go a little bit faster. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know, this is from Acts. This is the second passage where Paul demonstrates this. And this is Paul talking to the people in Antioch, Pisidian. He says, therefore, my friends, I want you to know, through Jesus, the forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. 
Through him, everyone who believes is set free from sin. A justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. By following the law of Moses, you are not able to be set free from sin. Today, if you follow... Oh, don't be careful. Hear me carefully. If you only follow the Ten Commandments, you will not be set free from sin. Because following the law does not justify you. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish. For I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. When you look at Old Testament prophecies, we always look at the specific context. And to understand an Old Testament prophecy, if the Bible tells us what it means, that's what it means, period. This amazing thing that Habakkuk is telling the people of Israel that will happen, this thing that you can't imagine, even if someone told you, is that you will be made righteous, not by your works, but because of what Jesus did. And that's so mind-blowing. And I want to suggest to you when Paul says in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, he doesn't say I'm not ashamed of Jesus. That's a different verse. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the power for salvation to all who believe first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. It's an absurdity. The gospel is absurd because you can't do anything about it. All you do is put your faith in Jesus and God does the rest because God justifies. Let's go to the next slide. He says the same thing in Hebrews 10, 1 to 18. Go ahead, go. Homework, read Hebrews 10. Go ahead, next one. Next one. All right, let's get back to this text here. So, if you're like me, I made a name of myself going through school by learning how to beat the system, right? So, I kept track of all my grades. I knew exactly what I needed to get in order to pass a class. And if it was 60, I didn't study. Why would I be so wasteful with my resources. And so I was shocked to learn my son, well, I shouldn't say just my children do the same thing. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to tell them to study hard when they're like, oh, dad, I only need a 65 on this in order to get, you know, it's not worth the extra 40 points to get, you know, from a B plus to an A minus, so I'm not going to do that. But anyway, so if this is the case, then Paul says this, if that's the case, and if God's grace and Jesus' love, uh, Jesus' forgiveness covers sin, wouldn't it be amazing if there's more sin, then God's grace is even bigger, right? Because then it's like, well then, you know what? I'm going to be a testimony to the amazing grace of God, and I'm going to do don't, Johnson, you were like this too. <laughs> then the more wrong I do, the greater all of you will see what God's grace is like. Right? Because the more sin I do, the more I'll be forgiven, and the more you'll be blown away by the goodness and grace of God. Some of you don't think that way. I can tell by your faces. <laughs> And Paul catches this really quickly, okay? He nips this in the bud, right? And this is important for us to understand. The Old Testament covenant is fulfilled with the death of Jesus Christ, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He gives us a new covenant. But doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? Absolutely not. Romans 6, 1, what then shall we say? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism and the death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Here's what we need to understand. If you are a Christian... You are a new creation. Your life is no longer determined by the must, but by the can and by the I want to. You see, you have a desire in your heart to live in a way that honors the Lord. Of course you're going to fail. But you have a desire. You have that. You have a different, you're a totally different person. 
You are not, and I've said this several times over the last year that I've been here, you are not a person who was okay and then you learned some skills and you got a little bit better okay. You got a little bit gooder. No, if you're a, if you're a Christian, you were dead and now you are alive. You weren't bad and now you are good. It's a fundamental difference. And Paul talks about this, how he died to sin and he died and he lives in Christ now. We'll get into that next Sunday as well. Okay? So you're not a bad person who got good. You're a dead person who became alive. And if you're an alive person, and this is what John 3 says. John 3, we always talk about to be born again. If you go look at that passage, what does it actually say? To be born from above. You're born from below here on this earth. But John 3, when Jesus talks to Nicodemus, he tells him, you must be born from above. It's a different kind of birth. It's a completely different thing. Because you are a new creation. You are a new creature in Christ. Go ahead. For through the law, I died to the law so I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself to me. So my shift in thinking goes from I must to I can. Go ahead. And here's an amazing verse. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness, if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. See, if I can be made right before God by obeying all the commandments and doing all the right things, then Jesus didn't need to die. And if that's true, then Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, when he just lays it all out, then your faith is for nothing. What are you doing this for? Just be good. That's so how he says that's not how it is. That's not how it is. I want to close this here, going back to me. How am I doing about, with this? This desire, this urge to just do a little bit more, to just be a little bit better. Ah, I've got to figure out how to make this feeling go away, this sense of inadequacy, this, this idea of being fulfilled. If, if, you're not, if you're an atheist, you probably think more fulfilled than justified or made righteous or restored. How are you doing? I want to suggest to you, stop. Stop trying. You'll always have a desire for when Christ returns. There's a sense of yearning in your heart. Of course there is, because this isn't what we were created for. But I want to close this here with this verse before I give you your homework. It's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's a summary of everything I just said here. Again from Paul. And this is not from yourself. It's the gift of God. See, God gives you a gift that if you believe in faith in Jesus, God gives you a gift. And that gift is salvation, that being made righteous, being justified before God. And it's not by works so that no one can boast. There's no need for you to compare to see who's a better Christian. Oh, you know, kids, oh, you know, I'm so much better than my sister. She's so bad. That's just the other way around. You know? No, there's no boasting. There's none of this. It's by faith you have been saved. Uh, by grace you have been saved through faith. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide here. Further study. <laughs> you can take a picture of this if you want to. Read the entire book of Galatians out loud again. If you haven't done so already, read Romans 6 to 8 and Hebrews 10. What does it tell you about the law? And then make a list of the before and but now. Okay? That's, that's that principle. I don't want to give it a name, but the word, you know, the but now in the Bible those are so significant. That is such a significant word in the Bible. Um, but now. But, you know, it was like this, but now it's like this. Write those themes down. Um, two resources for you as you study yourself. Um, I suggested, go ahead and go to the next slide, Jeff. Oh, let's do this one instead. Um, next Sunday, Galatians 3, 1 to 25. You know, we'll look at what the purpose of the law is. And when Paul says he's no longer a slave to the law, and he also says he's no longer a slave to sin. What does that actually mean? And then on September 3rd, we'll look at this idea of our new status and what does it mean for us to be adopted as children of God. Okay, here's the resources. How to read the Bible for all it's worth. It's been very helpful for me in just putting it in place. And then if you like to study yourself, biblehub.com. And click on interlinear and you can actually find the original words. And it's just fun. If you're kind of a geeky nerd, um, spend hours 
Sorry, Ross. <laughs> you, and my, you and I have spent hours on this, I'm sure. <laughs> um, but it's really good to see this, okay? All right, let's, uh, let me close us with a time of prayer, and then Peter will come up for another one. Lord, thank you for showing us clearly that we cannot be saved by following the law. We'll look next week of what this new law is that you put on our hearts, this new law that you've written into our hearts. And Lord, you warn us. You say, no, don't sin more so that grace would abound. We still, we still because we are different and because we're created, we're, we're, we're created from above, we're born from above, there's something different about us. And so, Lord, we don't want to take this teaching about how obeying the law doesn't justify us to the extent that we say, well, then whatever, do whatever I want to do, because we know that doesn't honor and that doesn't please you. But, Lord, I, it's, it's a freeing thing for me to understand that I don't have to be so much better. I don't have to do so much more. By believing in you, by putting my faith in Jesus Christ, you will forgive my sin and you will justify me and make me right before you. And that's a place of comfort and a place of rest. And I can stop trying so hard because I look at what you've done and it's completed and it's finished. Thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand up and...